Hi everybody and welcome back. Um, today's mini lecture will be going over scope, static, linked lists, and arrays in Java. So let's jump right in. So let's go over a Java review first. Um, let's first talk about arrays in Java. So the key thing to know about the array data structure in Java is that it's fixed size. So that means the size doesn't increase and it doesn't decrease. So a good example, maybe for when you'd want to use an array, is let's say you have a class of 30 students. You know these students are permanently in your class. No students will be added. No students will drop the class. Um, then you might want to use an array. So here I put a little code snippet um, of some examples of initializing some new arrays. And there's a few things I wanted to point out. The first thing is that there are a few different ways to instantiate a new array. Um, the first way is kind of these first two examples. You could pass in the length of the array. In this case, I just did zero for both. And then the second case, when you know the actual values that are going to go into your array, you could just pass in those values. And then the second thing I wanted to point out was um, in Java, everything is declared with a type, and this is also true for arrays. So on the very left-hand side of all these statements, you can see the type of that array. So we have a string array, for example, and an int array as another example. Um, and this is also another overview of Java types. In Java, we have eight primitive types, bytes, shorts, ints, long, float, double, boolean, car. Um, and a primitive type means that we store the location of the variable in memory. And so what this looks like as an example is say we have the variable x, which is an integer that equals 5. We store that at that actual location inside that x box is 5. The other example is a reference type. So reference types are strings, classes, interfaces, and then arrays, which we just talked about. Um, and then instead of it being actually in the box, it's now a pointer to the location in memory. Um, and so looking at this example at the very bottom right, we have our array R, and, and then it points to the array with 1, 2, th 3, and 5. So just know that this difference does exist, and it will be important when we draw environment diagrams. So let's talk about pass by value and what that means. Um, Java is pass by value, and that means that all the function arguments we ever pass into Java, any you know, functions that you create, um, the main method, um, literally any function, they're passed by value. Um, and this is really important when we draw environment diagrams and figuring out what things are looking like um, when the code is executing. And just remember, primitive types will directly copy and reference types, we copy the reference or like the pointer and not the actual object. So now I want to walk through a quick example with this environment diagram walkthrough. Okay, so now let's take a look at this example. So in this example, we have a main class. And then inside this main class, we're defining a variable x, then we're defining an array called r, and then we're going to call this do something method on x and r. And then we'll figure out what to do from there in this do something method. But let's first do these first steps. So first step, we are going to make a new variable x and we can see that now on the right we have x and stored in there is zero and then we also have r which we just created and remember that r is going to have a pointer to this actual array and now we're going to call the do something method so when we call the do something method we're going to pass in x as one argument and we're going to pass in r as another argument so this is kind of that pass by value that i was talking about for java and so what happens here is we open this do something method and why we directly copy in the bits from x. So we directly just copy zero into that box, but other we're actually going to copy this pointer to the array. So we're copying that pointer instead of the making like the exact same thing twice. And then inside here, we're going to set y to nine and then we're going to set other of two to four. So our first step setting y to nine. So you can see y just changes to 9 here. And then our next step is we set other at position 2 to 4. So other at 0, 1, 2 now becomes 4 here. 
And so as you can see, this actually did change this underlying array R because that also points to the same thing. So now R at position two is also four. So those are just kind of the differences um, between these two different values that are being passed in and kind of what this means by Java pass by value. So now let's talk more about linked lists in Java. What is a linked list exactly? You can imagine a chain of friends holding hands. That's a good way to think about a linked list. Um, it's similar to that chain of friends, but instead it's a chain of elements that we call nodes. So each element in that linked list is called a node. And then each node has a special link to the next node. So why do we want to use this new data structure? Well, first of all, arrays can't be added to, but linked lists can. So that's a benefit to them. Also, inserting and deleting items from a linked list is pretty fast and efficient, and we'll discover how this works in the next few slides. So taking a look at linked lists in Java code now, how would we make a new linked list? How would we perform different methods with it? So making a linked list, you need to import the linked list library, and then you can make a linked list, um, but you do need to specify the type of that linked list. So this one, we specified that it's a string, um, and then we just make that new linked list. And then you can add elements to your linked list. So there's a few ways to do that. You can add the object, you can add the index in the object, you can add all and add a collection like an array. You can also remove elements. You can use the remove method or the remove first or the remove last methods. And then you can access elements. You can use the get method, get first, get last, and you can search for elements using index of, last index of, and things like that. So those are just like the helpful methods to use when making a new linked list. But now I also want to touch on types of linked lists and kind of what these look like. So this is the most common traditional, what we just saw the code for too. This is just the traditional singly linked list. What this means is that each node is just connected by one hand to the next node, like a chain of friends holding hands. And then usually um, we have something called data and that kind of stores whatever is inside the node. So let's walk through some examples now. To get the node, um, a and get that data inside of it, we could use head.data. What exactly does this mean? So let's look at the head pointer here. This is pointing to this entire node A. And then to get the data, we have to use java.notation, which is kind of accessing something, and then get that data, which is inside A. We could also get the data inside node B. Now it gets a little bit more complicated because we need to get all the way from the head to B. And so to do this, we could use head, and then we see we have this whole A, and then we can use the next pointer that points to B, get that next one, then get the data at that next. So you can see we used a double dot notation. So this is getting a little messy. Lastly, what if we wanted to get the entire node D? What would we do here? Um, in this case, we can also use these next pointers, just like we did in the last example. So we could start at head, which is this node. We can get the next, which is this node. We get the next, which is this node. And then the last next is going to point to this node D. So we see that we need three nexts here. I also wanted to show you some other examples and types of linked lists that you might work with in this class. This is a doubly linked list. Um, this is just when there's kind of two connections, one forward, one back. That's why it's double. It's pretty cool. There's also a circular linked list. And this is when the very end loops all the way back to the front. And so it's just a complete circle. We also have a combination of the last two, a doubly circular linked list. This one's a little crazy. Um, and this is what it looks like. Now I wanted to touch on sentinels. So sentinel, that's a funny word. You probably haven't heard it before. It's a special type of node. 
and it's often used as an empty placeholder in a linked list. So you can think of it as kind of just serving the purpose to be there as empty and just as a little placeholder. So you never really put anything important in it. And then it'll simplify the process actually of adding and deleting nodes, nodes because you could just do it from that Sentinel node. So here's a really helpful example that kind of illustrates what that Sentinel's purpose is. You can see we have the head like normal, but now we have this extra Sentinel that's just kind of like an extra little foam block or placeholder that sits there. So just in case maybe we wanted to add a new element to the front or the back, we could really easily do that. And so now lastly, I just want to talk about some final tips for linked lists. There's a few ways to iterate through linked lists. I most commonly see people do a while loop. This is for just the traditional one and just checking that the next element isn't null and then just keeping go through the linked list. Um, I also want to say linked lists get pretty messy pretty quickly. So I would recommend using the Java Visualizer on IntelliJ for any coding related problems that you do with linked lists. And then lastly, practice does make perfect for linked list exam questions. Um, midterm one does heavily test on linked lists. I'm pretty sure everyone in the past few years has had a linked list problem, um, but you can get better. And I think practice with these makes perfect. They really try to trip you up with like dot next, dot next, dot next, dot next. Um, but I do believe in everyone. And I think if you practice enough of these problems, you should be able to ace them on any midterm or final exam. Um, that's pretty much all I have for everyone, but thank you so much for tuning in um, and have a great rest of your day.